So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished Ambassador Moser, Deputy Minister Kiber, and distinguished uh, delegation of U.S. Congressional Delegation at ASEAN, thank you for having you here, thank you for coming, thank you for joining us at this event. Here in front of you is the future of Moldova, students from all universities of the Republic of Moldova delegations, which are uh, waiting to address the questions of the current uh, uh, issues which are happening now in Europe and so on. Uh, and also, uh, dear, uh, dear colleagues, I would like to present you today's senators, people which uh, are truly friends of Moldova, but before that, let's clap and support uh, their arrival here in the Republic of Moldova. Thank you so much, senators, for coming. I will start the presentation from Senator John McCain, elected to the Senate in 1986, serving now his fifth term, member of the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations, Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs. And I can recall Mr. McCain's CV for hours and hours, because this incredible man has accomplished so many great things in his life. So thank you for joining us here, and thank you for being such an enthusiastic supporter of Moldovan developments on the way of democracy and progress. Thank you for that. I also may use this opportunity, Senator McCain, to remind you that during your visit in 2011, uh, as an alumnus of U.S. exchange programs, uh, we we met with you, and for me, uh, meeting you was a truly inspiring example of to see a real patriot, to see a man that loves his country, that loves what he does, and that people around uh, him are inspired to do many, many positive actions. So, for me, you are a truly inspiring example of how young generations should, should look and how uh, we should be acting in order to shape our future in a better context. So thank you uh, on, from my side once again for that and the valuable lesson which you have taught me. Uh, also, I would like to praise the presence of uh, Senators uh, of United States Senate and uh, uh, it's, it's my privilege to present Senator John Barroso. He's elected in the office from the state of Wyoming. In 2012, he was elected to a full secure term. Uh, in 2012, like I said. He's serving in Energy and Natural Resources Committee, uh, in Environment and Public uh, Works as well, and also in the Indian and Foreign Affairs Relations Committee. Thank you, Senator, for, for joining and being with us here. And also, it's my privilege to present Senator John Hoven. He's a Republican Senator from North Dakota, who swore into the Senate in 2011. Before to his appointment, Senator Hoven served as governor of North Dakota for 10 years. I bet you have a lot of, uh, a lot of good stories to tell us about from that previous experiences. Thank you for being here with us. It's also my privilege to present Senator uh, Ron Johnson. He was elected to the Senate in 2011 from the state of Wisconsin. He's a member of the Republican Party. Senator Johnson serves in the Committee on the Budget, uh, Commerce, Science and Transportation, but also in the Foreign Relations, Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs and Small Businesses and Entrepreneurship Committee so far. Thank you for being here and joining us at this session. Ladies and gentlemen, by presenting your amazing personalities, it's now my privilege to uh, give you, Senator McCain, uh, the floor for the opening remarks. And then we can start an incredible, lovely session with students from Moldova. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for those kind words. Uh, politicians are not very popular in Washington these days, so we're pleased to to have your kind remarks, and uh, most importantly, we are very happy to have the chance to meet with you, the future of Moldova, uh, the future of your country, and uh, it's an honor for us to have a chance to discuss with you the important issues of the day. And there are very important issues confronting us, as you well know, and there are direct threats in ways that we have not seen since the end of the Cold War. Uh, we have been visiting other countries. We were in the Baltics, Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania, where we had a chance to meet with leaders, and we also had a chance to meet with students at the universities there. And I have found that when talking with young people that it's much more valuable to listen to you and your questions and comments than you have to listen to me for any length of time. <coughs> so. Uh, these are difficult times. It is a time for solidarity and friendship and cooperation between all of us who are freedom-loving and, and lovers of democracy and free speech. 
and the right of nations to determine their own future and not determined by other nations. I know you've been following events in Ukraine very carefully. They are a violation of uh, Ukrainian sovereignty. They are a violation of the rights of the Ukrainian people to determine their own future. And uh, it is still not clear after Vladimir Putin has annexed uh, Crimea. I might remind you that there was a treaty made in return for Ukraine giving up their nuclear weapons that Russia and other nations would respect the territorial integrity of Ukraine, including Crimea. And this is, uh, and this activity has basically now um, in a grossly violation, grossly violated international law. The question is, is what does Mr. Putin do next? And it's not very clear, because I think it depends on what he thinks the penalty will be for further aggression. There's no doubt, however, that he has 40,000 troops massed on the border of eastern Ukraine. There's very little doubt that he is stirring up provocations and sending in to Eastern Ukraine individuals who are in his pay, including members of his military. And we are beginning to see some clashes taking place there a short time ago, as a few hours ago. So we hope that with a, a, a united Europe and the United States that we can make it clear to Vladimir Putin that the penalties that he will incur for further aggression, including movement across southern Ukraine and threatening Moldova, that it would be too heavy a price for him to pay. We can only achieve that by solidarity and cooperation and commitment between all European countries and the United States of America. These are difficult times. You've been through difficult times here in Moldova and you are the future of Moldova, Moldova, and I wish you every success. Thank you. Thank you so much. First of all, it is a real honor to be here. Uh, and like Senator McCain said, these are very difficult times. Let me tell you what gives me some hope. Uh, as we saw in the protests of the Maidan, so much of those protests were against corruption government. We've had an EU Prime Minister. There's a full recognition that corruption in government is incredibly harmful, obviously in self-governance, but also just in terms of getting your economy moving. Uh, I come from the private sector. I ran a manufacturing plant for 31 years. But one, one of the problems we have in America is we have decades of layer upon layer of regulation, which creates a great deal of uncertainty. You, you just you know, having made capital investment decisions, you want certainty. You need a legal framework that works, certainly a corruption-free legal framework that works. So from my standpoint, to see all the young faces here, to see the protests, uh, a recognition that you have to break free of that legacy of Soviet corruption in government to get your economies, to get your democracies moving, is a very positive sign. Uh, one other point I'd like to make is Within America's founding documents, we have probably the, the most wondrous vision for self-governance, the Declaration of Independence, which states that it is self-evident that, that men and women have certain inalienable rights. Among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And the pursuit of happiness is no trivial thing. It, it, you know, my, my, the goal I always set out for my children is to be happy. But the only way you can pursue happiness is with freedom. And that is what so many people, certainly in, in, in Europe, in Eastern Europe, in Moldova, are searching for, is that freedom. And we just want to come here and be as completely supportive of that as possible. We will be with you in your struggle to be free. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Wilson. I'm, I'm a doctor, and I, and I come here to tell you that because you're looking at some people who are citizens who are involved in politics. None of us did this to be politicians. We have a banker who then served as governor of his state. I'm a surgeon. We have a businessman, manufacturer for 31 years. And we have 
a, a man who is truly a world hero for his military commitments and his commitment to the fight for freedom. So none of us have gone the legal route. We have gone the citizen participant route. And I hope all of you will consider a lifetime of service as well uh, to your community as well as to your country. The, we, we are here because of the great concerns that we have with what's happening in this region. We were here in Ukraine uh, of several weeks ago uh, and, and shared our thoughts and visited with others and wanted to visit with you as well. We have great concerns over the way Vladimir Putin is using energy as a geopolitical weapon. And just like this, he can raise the cost of natural gas in the Ukraine by 44%. He can do similar things here and anywhere he wants. But if you take a look at what we need for freedom, you need energy, energy availability, and it has to be affordable energy. Not something that someone else controls and can use as a carrot or a stick to reward friends or to punish those who don't behave in the way that he wishes them to behave. So we are here supportive of your efforts working together with you to find a way to say no to Putin and yes to freedom. Thanks so much for letting me join you today. Thank you. My name is John Hoven. I'm a senator from the state of North Dakota. And as been mentioned, I was the governor prior for uh, my state. And uh, the action that uh, Russia and Putin have taken in Ukraine is wrong. And I believe that the United States, uh, along with the European Union, needs to impose sanctions uh, to stop that kind of behavior and make sure that there's a price that goes with it uh, to deter more of that kind of behavior and to try to ensure that people, whether they're in Moldova or Ukraine or anywhere else in the world, can make their own decisions, self-determination, decide what kind of country they want to have, as my colleagues have said, to be free. And so uh, we are here with you to show that solidarity and also to emphasize that, uh, that you are a huge part of what's going to happen in the future. Uh, we're working. Uh, amongst our colleagues in the United States Congress to put together sanctions to stop the kind of behavior that we've seen from Putin. And so we're learning from you so that we can understand the best things that we can do to make a difference. And one of the things that's come through very clearly and something that I think you can be a very big part of helping to solve and to address is the need for information. In our country, we have so many sources of information, so many channels on the television, so many different newspaper outlets, uh, obviously all the social media, Twitter, Facebook, so much competition that there's an incredible array of information. And that gives people access to the truth. You young people are so good with technology and with the internet. Work to get that information out, to give people the truth because the truth will set you free. And the more information that you can provide to make sure people understand the truth and what's really happening, all your citizens and citizens throughout Eastern Europe and in Russia, your friends, your relatives, provide that information wherever you can. Tell them the truth. Let them know what's going on. Because working together, working with you on all these things that my colleagues have mentioned, we can, for all of us, be free and decide what our future should be, not have somebody else decide it for us. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Senator Holden.
I think we can start now our discussion with the students from all over Moldova. So uh, again, I will remind you that we have two microphones. You can approach, present yourself, and address your question as concise and precise as possible. You may also join now. But before before we have the first question from the public, many young people all around the globe are so fascinated by the TV series called House of Cards, and a lot of them are saying that, oh my God, the life in the capital is so intense. Is it as intense as the TV series is presenting it as as senators? As, as being uh, fully employed uh, by, by them. Is the House of Cards really uh, emphasizing the, the real job which you do, or it's uh, less? House of Cards is much more entertaining than the life we live. <laughs> they have a lot more fun. A lot of fans Cards. now are so, so unhappy by your statement, you know that. Well, I wish, I wish you could see how really dull our life is. <laughs> Can you describe a little bit uh, of your job and uh, what is a senator doing? Because I bet a lot of uh, Moldovan young students are very interested and maybe we will have uh, good ideas for our parliamentarians to follow uh, in case if we have good practices. So uh, we have the first question, you can approach. Good afternoon, my name is Kristina Zandik, student at the International Economic Relations Faculty. Thank you for coming today, we are honored. Uh, as we know, the uh, United States of America and the European Union has put several uh, sanctions on the representatives from the Russian Federation. As we see till now, the sanctions have not given any uh, results. Uh, does the United States of America has a plan B uh, for uh, pursuing the Russian Federation to stop their actions and to respect the democratic values? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are preparing uh, and is the administration a package of, self, of much tougher sanctions. Uh, we are working together in the Congress and the Senate, actually, Republicans and Democrats, to come up with a much stronger set of sanctions. So far, I must say, the, the, the small amount uh, has been understandably uh, unimpressive to Vladimir Putin. But we are, with the Europeans, a very powerful bloc. There are a number of things that we can do, ranging from helping Georgia get into NATO, helping Moldova, if they wish, to come into the European Union, uh, starting restarting missile defense in Czech Republic and Poland, uh, making sure that, uh, that uh, Russia is out of the EA permanently rather than just a suspension. There's a long list of additional actions that we can take. And I personally am deeply disappointed that we have not provided defensive weapons to Ukraine as they are badly outgunned by a strong and professional Russian military. I am strongly believe that we should give them the ability to defend themselves particularly since we are not sure how far Vladimir Putin is going to go. Do you want anything? Yeah, thank you so much. we we'll go with the next question, please. Good afternoon, dear senators. Uh, I'm honored to meet you here. My name is Adrian. Uh, I'm uh, also a student at the International Relations Faculty at uh, the University. Also, I'm the member of National Council of Moldova. Since the proclamation of independence of the Republic of Moldova, the United States supported a lot, a lot of programs and projects to help the Republic of Moldova in order to, to develop. Uh, my question is, what programs or what priorities you foreseen as a, um, as a bridge for cooperation between the Republic of Moldova and the United States of America? Thank you. I'll, I'll have my, one of my colleagues answer that, but we've just had a very long and excellent meeting with the Prime Minister, and I previously met him in Washington and the Foreign Minister, and we went over a number of uh, requirements, maybe I think one of the things that America always wants to do is, first of all, set a, a good example of, of what it means to be a, a, an open, free society. But certainly everything we can do to support free elections, everything we can do to support anti-corruption in government, I think there's some discussion, discussion of some additional aid, uh, which I think people on this stage would, would certainly uh, support uh, to give you folks every opportunity to set up a, a strong democracy that's free of corruption. But we went through, there are certain specific items of aid that we can be of assistance, including loans, guarantees, including, by the way, a much greater effort on our part to 
provide a counter to the Russian media, which is watched and paid attention to by Russian-speaking peoples. We need to counter those lies that are coming out of, uh, over Russian television, which is not only uh, watched here in Moldova, but throughout this, uh, this region. Uh, Radio Free Europe needs to do a better job, but that job also needs to be in keeping with the new ways of communication. I bet everybody here uh, uh, communicates more by Twitter than they, with tweets than they do any other way, and and uh, and by Facebook and by the internet. And so we're going to have to counter, start with Russian television, but also means of communicating with young people. You were mentioning House of Cards. House of Cards is not on television, and it's the most popular show in the United States today. That shows you that if you're going to compete in a competition for ideas, you're going to have to get into to social networking. Finally, I'll never forget after I was in Egypt after the, the uh, demonstrations uh, overthrew Mubarak, and it was young people that did that. And one of the young men I met with pulled out his Blackberry and said, I can get 250,000 people in the square in three hours. That's that, this whole new means of communication with one another, not only within our countries, but in the world, is, uh, is what we have to concentrate our efforts on. And as Senator Johnson said, the truth is what will come out if we're able to communicate it. Senator, just to follow up on that, that, that was a, what I was trying to get, get at earlier, is you have the ability to communicate and therefore be a big part of building your future and a big part of the solution in the same way with uh, entrepreneurial activities, the training you did here at the university and the ability to start uh, new companies, whether it's related to technology and the internet or energy or any of these other areas, all of those things will build the strength of your country. When I was started as a governor uh, more than a decade ago, our state was not a large energy producing state. We were losing our young people, but by working hard to create a good business environment and getting our young people involved in entrepreneurship and developing technology, advanced manufacturing, working on some of the innovative, new, creative ideas that you have and bring forward here in this country versus going somewhere else, you can truly help build a future and build, uh, build your country. Thank you. Well, we go with the next question. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, my name is uh, Peter and I'm a student at International Relationships um, Faculty and uh, I, would start, I would like to start with a remark and it's not specifically a uh, target to USA but to all countries of the world. We would like more attention drawn to our con country, not only when the US Army, uh, uh, Russian Army is at our border. And my question will be specifically targeted at corruption and how did uh, USA manage to fight it, especially in the police departments, because we know it was heavily corrupted in the 30s, uh, well into the 60s. So how did the USA manage to fight with corruption, especially in the police sectors? Thank yeah, corruption. you very much. Thank you, quite universal uh, question of corruption. I'll just start, first of all, we didn't have a legacy there was a hangover from, from 50 or so years of Soviet rule, which was a tremendous, tremendous uh, uh, help to us. I mean, America really is premised on, on an idea, on a promise about freedom, about limited government. And that's extremely important to understand is that our foundational premise is that government isn't there to solve your problems. Government, by and large, is something to fear because as it grows, your freedoms recede. So our entire Success in society is based on freedom, a limited government, about people having the capability in freedom with, with personal responsibility and, and self-reliance and being able to aspire to things and to achieve. And so it's just so important that you have a limited government that does not have that power over people, that is not corrupt, so that people can actually utilize that free, freedom and put it to good economic use. Transparency and a free press. Transparency and a free press are the two fundamental elements, I believe, in fighting uh, corruption. 
the early 1970s, a free press brought down the President of the United States. And without a free press, then uh, it makes it incredibly difficult to really get at the root of corruption. So there, there's an idea, idea for some of you uh, young potential entrepreneurs right there. Start a newspaper, start a TV station, start some type of uh, information business. But by, let me, let me, by the way, I hate the press. <laughs> but let me, let me just add, because we have seen, in our trips here, we've seen examples of extraordinary bravery and courage on the part of members of the press. The, the, only, the only way we're going to combat this, the only way to get that information out is to have people have the courage to go behind the lines, take pictures to get the videos out there of what's, what really is the truth. And so we just, you know, first of all, thank the press for, for their courage and bravery and courage to continue to do so. Well, we saw we were in, uh, we were in Ukraine the day that the uh, Russian helicopters uh, landed right before they took over the Crimea to take over the gas plant just north of the Crimea. And what we heard was, was that the free press had been shut down in Crimea because the Russians came in to control the message. And you have to make sure that a message cannot be controlled by others. We worry about uh, limitations on the internet. You see it in North Korea, you see it in Iran, where people who are just seeking information are not able to get it because of a, a government uh, who, who and the government makes the decisions to deny people information. You have to make sure that you're never denied the information that you seek. Could I mention that there's a very satirical uh, publication called The Onion, which makes fun of everyone. Many of you may have even seen it. It, it makes fun of politicians and takes events and uh, is very satirical. Um, and uh, not too long ago, they named the dictator of North Korea, Kim Jong-un. They named him as the sexiest man, one of the ten sexiest men in the world. Well, he's the, North Koreans, the North Koreans believed it, and they publicized the fact that Kim Jong-un was one of the ten sexiest guys in the world. Wonderful moment. Thank you. Maybe in this context you may comment because there is a, a reverse side of the coin when press is used as an instrument for propaganda. And we saw that Russia is using media armed forces actually in Ukraine when, when press is really manipulating the events. So how, how a journalist can, uh, can work in a, uh, uh, and, and be sincere in what he does if the state tries to impose a certain level of information? I don't know, but all I can tell you is that there have been a number of uh, reporters who have been killed in Syria trying to cover the atrocities of Bashar Assad there. It's a very dangerous line of work, and uh, that, that certain very brave people have uh, literally given their lives uh, and for the sake of trying to bring the truth back to the people of the world. But, but there are new ways. Uh, you know, your phone, the phone camera, the internet, picking up on a story that Senator Barroso talked about. When we were in Ukraine, the way we found out that Russians were landing near Crimea at a power station was not through the press, but rather through the internet, where people had used their camera phones to take the pictures. And those went worldwide. So again, as we talk about what can you do, um, how do we make sure the truth is out, with the internet, whether it's just you as individuals being active in public affairs or even starting something like an internet-based internet business. You have incredible power now. Never underestimate the power that you have. Thank you for your remarks. We have the first question from the left corner. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, dear senators. I'm Alessandro Casacolo. I'm a student at the International Economic Relationships, second course. A little question, uh, since the the uh, premier conflict began, the Westminster authorities, unrecognized, have attempted twice to enter in the Russian Federation as a region. My question is, what should you, Moldova, in the attempt to do in case if Russia continues to lead its expansion in Odessa and Transnistria? We have the Minister Kiber here as well. <laughs> I think it's a great threat. I think
think it's a grave threat, and I, I do not predict it. Please, don't get me wrong, I do not predict it. But I do believe it is something we have to at least consider might happen. But I am not predicting that it happens. I think that the Moldovan government and people will have to determine what reaction they would take to a Russian invasion. And I don't think it's appropriate, frankly, for me to tell the people of Moldova what they should do. But what I should tell the people of the United States of America and the world is that this is an outrage and we will never, ever, ever allow the, the, the Russian and Vladimir Putin to deprive uh, the people of Moldova of their liberty and their right to determine their own future. And any action that we can take, we will take in order to see that that doesn't happen, number one, and two, if it does happen, is reversed. I will never give up on Crimea because Crimea is part of Ukraine, not, not part of Russia. And someday the people of Crimea will be free, just as the people in the Baltic countries in this country, but particularly the Baltics as well, for years lived behind the Iron Curtain, and we call them the captive nations. And Ronald Reagan never stopped speaking up for them. And I would never stop speaking up for the people of Moldova and doing everything we can. But again, I don't predict that that is, is going to happen. I hope that we can take actions that, that would make Vladimir Putin convince him that that kind of action would be unacceptable to the world and he would pay too heavy a price for doing that kind of thing. Thank you. We are back to the right microphone. Good afternoon, my name is Veronica Veranda and I'm sitting in the UK. Uh, thank you so much for your answers, I really appreciate the honesty with which you answer them. And I would like to ask you a question which is disguised in a way in two questions. Um, since the interviews at CBS News, um, what do you think should US arm Ukraine? Uh, and if so, if the sanctions aren't enough, uh, should US arm Ukraine, is that uh, the next step? Is that the solution to, towards solving the problem? Uh, and also, if, if Moldova would be in a similar situation, to what extent would the US be able to help Moldova solve any conflict? Thank you so much. Well, I think that the United States has to declare our clear commitment, and we are, and we have, to the independence and sovereignty of the country of Moldova. Uh, and our president has said that, and I know he will continue to say that. Second of all, there's certain economic assistance that's needed that we hope to accelerate. There is uh, a number of uh, military relationships which have been developed between the United States and the Moldovan military. And we can pursue those uh, options to make it clear of our commitment to freedom of Moldova. I would just kind of like to pull, pull the conversation back a little bit on, on a more macro level. You have to, first of all, you have to understand, you have to recognize reality. You know, that hope isn't a strategy. You have to actually listen to what Vladimir Putin said in the past, that the breakup of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe in the last century, and that he's trying to reconstruct it. So you have to recognize that reality. The other reality you have to recognize is, is ask yourself, what gives him strength? What gives Vladimir Putin strength is the fact that he has oil and gas reserves and that so much of Europe is dependent on those gas reserves. The other thing that gives him strength is our weakness. So we, we need to address those two particular problems. We need to open up world energy markets. You know, we certainly need to start exporting out of the United States in terms of our, our vast energy resources. But we need to show strength and resolve. If we show strength and resolve, that will weaken Vladimir Putin. So there are all kinds of different actions we can take to show that strength and resolve, uh, including, you know, honoring the requests of people seeking freedom and democracy to be able to defend themselves. As you know, I was sanctioned by Vladimir Putin. You didn't, maybe you knew that. I was not able to spend spring break in Siberia this year. <laughs> um, 
but I but I do agree that long term, you know, I, I've said that Russia is a gas station masquerading as a country. And I apologize for that because actually it's a mafia-run gas station masquerading as a country. But the fact is that long term, we can achieve energy independence and when Russia no longer has the revenues uh, from energy that they enjoy today, it will collapse their economy because it's, it's a government run by kleptocrats, corruption, and 80% of their revenues are strictly from uh, their energy exports. Uh, when you look at their demographics, when you look at the corruption, when you look at alcoholism, when you look at all the indicators, uh, Russia is not a country on the ascendancy. It's a country in decline. Well, one thing I would add, you said you're from the UK? Uh, I study in the UK, but I'm from Moldova. Oh. Um, it's very important that the European Union join with us in sanctions. And I think if we have travel restrictions, visa restrictions, if we have asset freezes, there's a number of uh, sanctions that we can put in place together that will have a dramatic effect on Russia and uh, their economy that I think will be a very, very big problem for them. And I think they need to know that that's exactly uh, what we intend to do. Uh, and uh, I think it will have a very big impact. Thank you. We go with the next question now. Good afternoon and thank you for being here. My name is Alina. I am a law student and my question is concerning the elections which are going to take place in uh, November this year. Can you give us a piece of advice, uh, not only to us as citizens, but also to our political parties? What can they do to make sure that, um, and I mean here by political parties from like liberal and democratic parties, what can they do to make sure that the Communist Party won't get enough votes to create a majority in the parliament? Because um, honestly, although we support um, our uh, democratic and um, liberal parties and um, the coalition, which is uh, ruling right now, we are still afraid that the communists can win the elections from 2013. Thank you. It's really about getting the truth out to individuals. It's really about showing what economic models work, which economic models fail. And so, you know, again, we have heard loud and clear the propaganda that Russia is foisting on the publics in, in Moldova and, and Ukraine and Eastern Europe has been incredibly effective. So we have to counter that. So one of the commitments I think we're going to take back to the United States to do everything we can, whether we resurrect Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, we've got to do a far better job as America trying to convey the truth about what a free market enterprise system actually does and how it has lifted more people out of poverty and produce stronger middle classes across the world than any other system. The, the economic model that, that Russia is trying to voice in its public fails. That's why the Soviet Union collapsed. I mean, take a look at Venezuela. It's an oil-rich nation, yet because of Hugo Chavez's failed socialist experiment, it's a basket case, and I always point out to your audiences that not too many people vacation the island paradise of Cuba. So democracy, freedom, free market enterprise systems actually work, and that's, the, I think, to me, the primary piece of information that has to get out there. I am told that there's 15,000 students at this university. If every one of those 15,000 students got engaged in this political campaign in the next few months, then I believe that they could be a decisive factor in who wins the election. Thank you so much. I would like to say that it's a great honor to have you here, Mr. Sanders. My question is addressed to Senator McCain. In one of your uh, interviews you gave earlier this month, you stated that uh, you support the, uh, the faster integration of Georgia and Moldova into the structures of NATO, especially in the conflicts in the, in the nearest regions. Uh, what exactly does the acceleration of the path of Georgia and Moldova uh, involve from your point of view? Thank you. Well, first of all, I hope that my remarks were intended that I'm not trying to tell the government and people of Moldova what to do. I would like to personally see them on the road to membership in the European Union and eventually NATO if the people of Moldova approve of such a move. Uh, but 
I believe, and I don't think there's any doubt from looking out over this audience, that the people of Moldova are oriented to Europe. The music, the culture, everything. Of it. I like the people of Ukraine. They're not oriented toward Russia. They're oriented towards European music, culture, everything else. And it seems to me that most Moldovans would be much more comfortable as part of Europe than as part of Russia. Now, I can express my ideas, but I don't. I don't intend to uh, impose my ideas on the people of, of Moldova, and I think that this upcoming election, that particularly the alignment with Europe and the European Union, will be a factor in the uh, in the decision of the people that of this country make in the upcoming election, and I will respect that outcome. Just one quick point that I think is important to me. Joining NATO threatens no one. You know, integrating with the European Union is not a, a, a one-way street. Any, any country that trades with the, the European Union or America can also trade with Russia. It's different than if you it, move more toward Russia. It, that is a one-way street. So again, entry into NATO threatens no one. I think it's an incredibly important point to make. Thank you so much. We go with the next question now, please. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mikhaela. I'm a student also in international economic relations. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for coming and show the support for our country uh, due to this, the, the situation in the East. Uh, my question is following. Uh, as we all know that the U.S. is uh, supporting financially our country, and due to the high level of corruption, what steps will take U.S. in order to make sure that the money are spent correctly? Uh, one of the things that we work to do with not only Moldova but other countries as well is provide assistance through what's called the International Monetary Fund, and I think that that is an option for continued uh, assistance to Moldova uh, and other countries in the region. And one of the things they require as part of getting those loans and that assistance is that you uh, follow up and ensure that you are uh, rooting out corruption and working to prevent corruption. And that's very important because it helps in both ways. Both you get the financial assistance, but you get better government, which enables your country to succeed. May I say that I don't think there's any doubt that there is a corruption problem here. And I believe that the government is committed to rooting out that corruption. But I also know that it's always a problem. It's a problem in the United States of America. It's a problem in every democracy. And it requires vigorous pursuit, of transparency, and a media. That 90% of the problems of corruption that I know of that have been exposed in the United States, it's been through the media. And that's a, a very important factor. I believe it is a problem here, and I believe that the parties that will be seeking your approval will be hopefully addressing that issue in a concrete and a fashion that gives the people of Moldova some confidence in their government. Thank you so much. We go with the next question now, please. Hello, my name is Mikhail Sakirka. I'm a Benjamin Franklin Transatlantic Fellow Summer Institute alumni, and I'm a student at this same university. I study marketing, and besides marketing, I've got some several interests, as I'd like to not like to think, like diplomacy and foreign affairs, and especially the energy. I want to ask you, how do you see Moldova in a few years? Do you see it as a country which will be able to produce energy, alternative energy? Or shall we make partnerships with other countries to get energy from? Thank you. Well, as a, uh, as a Ben Franklin fellow, you remember the experiment with the kite and the uh, lightning striking the kite and uh, the development of electricity. Yeah, so of just think of what the future will hold with you and the market and the ability to market that and, and that uh, degree of uh, inventiveness. Uh, no, I would envision visiting with the Prime Minister today and, and the efforts that are being made with electrification as well as with gas imports from uh, Romania and, and others, uh, which takes investment, it takes time, and it takes political will uh, that I think that you're less, much less dependent 
on the sources of, uh, of gas that we've had in the past from Russia. Uh, because the focus is now there, the direction is there, the commitment is there. Uh, there has been a discovery uh, in the Black Sea of additional energy uh, sources. There are uh, opportunities abound, and I think that the more you can develop and create that future and control your own destiny, I think it's going to be better uh, for each and every, every one of the folks here today. The uh, energy future is very, very bright. It's changed dramatically for the United States in just the last decade. When I started as governor in my state, we maybe produced 100,000 barrels of oil, well, less than, less than 100,000 barrels of oil uh, a day. Now we produce a million barrels of oil a day through new technologies, through hydraulic fracturing. You may have heard of hydraulic fracturing through directional drilling. We'll drill down two miles underground, and then we'll drill miles underground. Better environmental stewardship, far more energy, to the point now where we actually, in our country, produce more natural gas than we consume. We want to export it to uh, countries here in Europe, which can be very important, as we've talked about, in your uh, future as far as security, national security, to reduce dependence on gas prime, okay? But my point is, the new technologies, the new ideas, create an exciting energy future. For young people like you, be part of that. How about developing some of that shale oil and shale gas here in this region? There are major companies, big, you know, companies like Exxon, Chevron, those kind of companies that want to drill in the Black Sea and other areas, and there are small companies, and you have great ideas and much to offer, and that is a source of strength, not only jobs and economic growth, but national security. I think you're really onto something. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we have the last question, and I see uh, three students over there. So sharing is caring. So how about uh, taking the one question, uh, like presenting your question quickly? Hello, my name is Sergio. I'm a student of finance and banking faculty, and I have a question. Uh, what consequences will support the European Union if they apply more severe sanctions against the Russian because they depend heavily on the Russian, Russian natural resources? and how they can bypass this economic or at least energetic crisis. That's why it's so important we work to develop these sources of energy, which is a real challenge uh, in the short run. And that's also why we're here to understand what kind of sanctions work that will truly deter the kind of behavior we've seen from Russia, but also work in terms of getting the EU to join with us in, in, in imposing uh, those sanctions. But you're right, the energy issue is a tough one, particularly in the short term. In the long run, we'll be able to solve it. We're already working to export natural gas, as well as help you develop natural gas and other energy sources. Uh, but that's why it's so important that we impose strong sanctions, but we get it right. Thank you. Look, could I just mention, we came from Lithuania. They have a power line from Sweden and they are have an offshore natural gas platform that they are developing. Within a, by the time the year is up, they'll have the natural gas platform. Within two years, they'll have the electricity from Sweden. And so they basically will no longer be dependent on Russian oil energy. And I see this kind of innovation and technology all over the world, much less in this part of the world where it's most vital. And in fact, we met with your Prime Minister and he's working on the same kind of things right now. Thank you. Let's go to the next one. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Marta Komeratsova and um, I have a question. You said that Crimea is a, part, is a part of Ukraine and it can be, can't be part of Russia. My question is, um, you spoke about freedom and do you think that people can't choose, can't select country where they want to live? Do you think people can have the right to choose the country where they want to live, specifically speaking of the referendum? I think people should be free to choose the country that they want to live, but I don't believe that because citizens of a country live in another country, that that gives that country the right to absorb that country into their territory. There's a huge difference. We want respect for, you know, we want respect for Russian-speaking people in whatever country they reside in in this part of the world. But it's not an excuse.
for Russia to go and make that part of another country part of the Russian part of Russia because they are Russian speaking peoples. But this 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 whole facade began with Adolf Hitler, who moved into countries outside Germany on the grounds that there was German speaking people that needed to be protected. And we sat by and watched that happen. I am not predicting World War III, but I am predicting that if Vladimir Putin pays no price for the actions that he's taking now, which are against all international law and normal behavior, then he will be encouraged to take further action. And history shows that when people like Vladimir Putin are allowed to carry out their ambitions uh, and without response, then sooner or later we have to respond. Thank you so much. Thank you for the question from the student. That was the last question from the from the student so far. Now we move for the press. Uh, so please, the first question from the press now. Good afternoon. My name is Diana Reilano, Radio Free Europe. Uh, first of all, we have to recognize that uh, students' questions were very good, so they actually covered all the questions that we, like press, have it. Okay, goodbye. <laughs> uh, still, uh, yesterday the Soviet Supreme, so-called uh, Parliament of uh, Transnistrian Region, they asked uh, Russia to recognize it. So, uh, do you think Russia will uh, could use this request in order to put pressure on Moldova and even stop it from its European way, taking in consideration that uh, Moldova in near future want to sign the association agreement with the uh, European Union? Thank you. So, as usually, it's a very complex and it has two parts. The first part is c concerning the Transnistrian demand to be uh, to be recognized by Russia and uh, the call which was made yesterday by their so-called parliament. And the second is uh, the, the assignment si si of the association. Russia, do you think can use this request to put pressure on Moldova and even to stop it from its European way? Uh, uh. First of all, that Crimean parliament or government is a joke, a facade, they're illegal, and they should be treated as such. I don't care what, what they say. Um, on the second question, I think Vladimir Putin is putting pressure on the Baltics. I think he's putting pressure on Moldova. I think he's putting additional pressures on other parts of Ukraine. As I mentioned earlier, we don't know what he's going to do next, uh, but he is preserving his option for further action. Otherwise, there wouldn't be 40,000 troops, Russian troops, on the, on the border of eastern Ukraine. So, um, all, all I can say is that I think that if we have a weak response or no response, then he will be encouraged to take further action. But I believe that our president and our European friends have spoken and will speak of the right of the Moldovan people to determine their own future. And that is, a, I think, a point that needs to be brought home to Vladimir Putin. Thank you so much. We go on the left side, please. First of all, I want to say welcome to Moldova. Yes, senators. And um, my name is Viral Ignat. I'm from the Kishinev Post uh, newspaper. And I have a very tough question, and I want to apologize for one of the words in, in this question. Uh, I would just want you to say it clear for entire Moldova and Ukraine's and other Baltic countries who was before in the Soviet Union. Why U.S. and Europe doesn't have enough balls in front of the dictator Putin? Why these two big unions, they are so afraid of this dictator? Thank you. I would like to have an answer for each one of you. You may be asking the wrong person because 
I have strong ad advocated much stronger response to Vladimir Putin. And let's let's have some straight talk. Russia has great influence over Europe because of the issue that we've been discussing here, and that's energy. And if Russia cut off the energy supply to Europe, it would have a significant effect. There are also business arrangements and ties, particularly amongst German industrialists, that also affect this. The French are selling a ship with helicopters to the Russians. It'll be very interesting to see whether the French will re reverse that decision or not. So all I can say is that you'd have to ask them why they don't show more of the part of the anatomy you just mentioned. <laughs> um, but uh, I believe that we are going to have to take stronger action. The Cold War lasted a long time. Moldova, the Baltics, the captive nations were kept under then-Soviet rule for a long time. But we never stopped, and we never gave up, and we always spoke for them, and we did everything we could to bring them freedom. And I believe that the people of Crimea will be free. I believe that Vladimir Putin, as I said before, is probably in the ascendancy now, but he cannot maintain a position of significant strength given all of the factors that affect the future of Russia today. Thank you for the question. Thank you for the record. Yeah, I would like to have an answer. Sure, I'll, I'll give you my theory. Uh, I'm a citizen legislator, never, never involved in elective office until I ran in 2010 for the U.S. Senate. I'm a business guy, a manufacturer. I, I think when I ask most crowds, you know, what is the primary motivating factor of most politicians? They answer correctly to get elected. I think most politicians in the West are far too short-sighted. They are not willing to either incur the economic pain or the political pain of doing what I think needs to be done, show the strength, to show the kind of resolve. But it's incredibly short-sighted because, and this is why we have to get information out, why people need to understand the long-term consequences will be far more costly if we don't show the kind of strength and show the kind of resolve. So I, I just think it's, it's weakness on our part. It's weakness on the part of politicians in the West. We need politicians that have the part of the anatomy you're talking about that are willing to show the kind of strength and resolve that's needed at this point in time. Well, I believe that the response has been uh, too weak and too slow coming. Uh, the four of us were in Ukraine three weeks ago in Kiev visiting the new president, the new prime minister, and speaking our support as Americans elected to the United States and our support for the people of Ukraine. We are here today in Moldova to tell you that we are here supporting each and every one of you and all of your efforts. So we have that commitment, but I think that the response has been slow and weak and the best response we can do is today, because the response gets more expensive as the time goes on in dealing uh, with Putin. Today is the day uh, to act. Uh, there are need for immediate response, but also long-term response to really undermine Putin economically is the use of uh, energy as a geopolitical weapon against Russia so he cannot continue to afford to prop up his government with other people's money who are paying paying for his energy, and that's what we're focused on as a member of the Energy Committee and the Foreign uh, Relations Committee that long term. But that involves time, it involves investment of capital, and it involves political will from all of those who you've mentioned. Uh, we're here because we believe that the action does need to be stronger. So we're here to show that solidarity, and we're also here to make sure that we understand what steps can be taken that will be effective to provide that stronger support, and we intend to go back and work hard to do it. Thank you for your Thank question. you very much. Thank you for your answers, and we go to the next. Uh, my name is uh, Andrei Rizescu from Adelor uh, Moldova newspaper, and I want to address a question to Mr. Santo. Okay. So, uh, we've all seen what uh, happened in Crimea, we've all seen what happened in the southern Ukraine. Uh, what will happen if the Russian troops will come to Transnistria and uh, 
how will uh, the Western forces, uh, including the US, including the NATO, will intervene in such a case? Thank you. You know, it's, it's hard for me to answer a question like that because you don't know how this would happen, under what circumstances, whether it's some kind of uh, uprising within Trans Transnistria. Um, it's very difficult. But, obviously, that it would arouse uh, a world reaction. I believe that it would be uh, unacceptable. I think it would move us to have much closer ties with the government of Moldova. It would, I think, trigger our military assistance and training and equipping, uh, helping the Moldovan military. But I honestly have to say to you that it would be an act of gross violation of international law and I would hope that the world community and especially Europe and the United States would uh, do what it can to make sure that that kind of activity, it, there's a very heavy price paid for it. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have another question. Um, hi, my name is Christina. I'm a reporter for a news website, um, Politik.com. Um, actually, I have two questions. Can I? Or this one? Two. Can, can I? Okay. Uh, should I put them both together? I mean... Uh, yes, yeah, so it would be fantastic if you take you know, take them both in one speech. Um, I think so. I have just one. Um, you know uh, um, that in a few days we'll, get, we'll have a free visa regime with the European Union. So. My question is, is there any plan, maybe an action plan, in the United States for a um, free visa regime for Moldova with the United States? You know, it's a homework for you now. I, I don't know if I don't know if there is any specific uh, plan as far as a free, uh, free visa agreement on the part of the U.S. I think that that shows uh, initiative on the part of your government, which I think Grand Prof is saying they were going to do that. So they're following through and fulfilling one of their pledges uh, to the voters, which is very, very important. And uh, I don't think it requires any specific action on the part of the United States, other than we would be supportive and obviously be open to trade and commerce of, of any kind. Uh, and the other thing is I uh, just want to commend you for having a news website. Good for you. <laughs> Thank you so much. And the second question, please, quickly. Second question is um, for Mr. McCain. Um, if you would see uh, the communist leader, Mr. Vladimir Borodin, um, what would you tell him? I guess it's going to be an interesting conversation. If you would uh, meet communist leader Vladimir Borodin of Communist Party of Moldova, what you would tell to the communist leader? Uh, I would tell him how disappointed I was that I was unable to go to Siberia this spring for my vacation <laughs> since he sanctioned me. Uh, I'd also ask him to put his shirt on. Uh, but seriously, I, I would say to him that the United States of America has a long history of, of standing up to dictators. And we won the Cold War. He lost. We won. He lost. And for him to try to restore the old Soviet uh, Russian Empire. Sorry, Senator McCain. Uh, I think the question was specifically about the local communist, uh, about Vladimir Voronin. He is the leader of Moldovan Communist Party. Uh, the local Communist Party. <laughs> I think I have to echo the sentiments that my colleague from Wisconsin made, and that is that we do not interfere in elections in countries that we visit. It is not, it's, it's totally inappropriate for us to tell the people of Moldova how they should vote, and I won't do that. But as Senator Johnson pointed out, communism failed. Communism did fail because their theories 
of how economies work uh, did not, did not, was not successful. So uh, I would ask them to read Milton Friedman and some other, maybe The Economist magazine, some other periodicals, and maybe they can broaden their outlook on how economies are supposed to function. Thank you so much. We go with the last question now from the journalist, please. Okay, I'm Nina Guzu from Radio Kishinau, and my question will be very related to what one of the students asked and one of my colleague uh, journalists asked, but I didn't understand very clearly. So in, we see now that the situation is very tension in here in Ukraine. We see what um, is doing now the so-called authorities in Transnistria. So my question would be like that, um, how clearly and with what concrete things is ready the United States to help Republic of Moldova in case Putin uh, will have some demands? We don't know with what will end here is very tension. So what are the concrete things? And uh, more concrete, if United States is ready to help military Republic of Moldova. E economic assistance packages. Uh assistance with the election electoral process, the International Republican Institute and other organizations here to help to make sure that this is uh, an election that everybody participated in. There are certain economic uh, requests that we uh, should consider and, and, um, and, and uh, allocate funds for. Uh, if there is um, a need for entry into various international organizations uh, such as the IMF, the World Bank, other ways of financial assistance uh, that we could provide. That we can have a closer relationship militarily as far as training and, uh, and, and provision of military capabilities and integration into the, uh, uh, the European military uh, alliances. Uh, I don't mean NATO, I'm talking about uh, training and other ways of working together uh, to make uh, Moldova a more capable military uh, than they have today. Um, there is a, I, I'd be glad to mention more ways, but finances right now are very in helping restore the economy, including free trade between our countries as well, I think would be something we should seriously consider. Thank you so much, dear students, dear journalists. The last thought is, of course, we should build stronger bridges over the Atlantic Ocean, and of course, we should connect our ties and work hard on the public diplomacy, because investment in people, investment in ideas, and when we speak about here, human rights, democracy, free press, are the most valuable so far. Thank you for being with us, and have a lovely stay in Moldova, and as you see, future of Moldova looks promising with all the young people. Thank you.